Hello and welcome on Watches TV and today well, we're very glad to bring to you a very interesting interview done here in our club space in the old town of Geneva with uh, Madame Evelyne Janta, who for the 10th anniversary of the passing of legendary uh, watch designer Mr. Gérald Janta, has curated some of his original drawings and watercolors to be auctioned by Sotheby's. So the first selection of 30 lots is currently on sale and the entry price is often quite reasonable but as you can expect some designs are being uh, quite sought after. Well, think of the original Royal Oak design, for instance. Well, let's have this chat and learn more about the designer's curriculum and his insatiable creativity, how he worked and what it meant for him to have his own brand. Let's go. My husband was half Swiss, half Italian. He was very proud to be Swiss, of course, but also very, very proud of his Italian heritage, to which he attributed his talent, his artistic flair and uh, he always felt very close to the Italian uh, Leonardo da Vinci and all these trends. So um, he would take us to his town of origin, which was called Vercelli, and uh, there he would say, here we are, I come from the rice growers of Italy. And um, so he had this dual um, heritage, which I think made him what he was. And artistically speaking, was he always very creative as a child already? Did he knew that, that this was going to be like the he direction? He certainly was, because I have little drawings of him, a little painting that he did when he was 12 years old of his family, little caricatures and everything else. Then when he was 16, 17, 18, he would paint already. And I have some of marines, you know, that he did of the harbour of Saint-Tropez. So it was always always about creation. And in the end, just before he passed away, he could fulfill his dream and make a beautiful sculpture, which is uh, about three meters high and which is in Stade, actually. So he was able to make one sculpture fully. So he, he tried all sorts of things, but painting was definitely what he loved most. Uh, Gerald uh, stopped school very, very early because his family were incredibly poor. And by poor, I mean, you know, Dickens type of very, very poor. And so his mum went blind, his dad was doing odd jobs. So Gerald, from the age of 14, was going to school a bit, but also helping out, doing errands, uh, working as an usher in the, in the cinema, all sort of little jobs. So he never went to any school, nor any artistic school. He learned everything by himself. Okay, really self-taught then, yeah. And uh, so what were his first um, artistic um, profession, I would say? And I don't know if you can say He that. designed, funnily enough, people don't really know that, but he designed clothes. And uh, he, he always felt that if he had been French, he would have designed clothes. If he had been Italian, he would have been doing cars. His absolute dream would have been to be the Pinifarina of cars. Because he was Swiss, he was doing watches. But to him, it's always applied art. So he started apparently designing a few dresses, which went quite well. And then he did go to one school where he learned how to make jewelry for one year. So Gerald could actually make a ring physically. He stayed there one year, then straight went to work for a bracelet factory called Ponti Genari. And, uh, but Gerald being Gerald, didn't get on very well with people after a year and said he didn't want any bosses and he wanted to be free and walked out and then started designing. Jewelry and watches. And in fact, he designed, I have a lot of designs of jewelry. He was excellent at jewelry designs, which people do not know. Uh, he, at some point, was working with Gilbert Albert and uh, they got on very well. And I have some designs that they were, that they sort of made together, where Gilbert Albert said like a necklace and then Gerald made the, the watch inside. So yes, he, 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 you know, he, he liked both, but then he went into, into watches. He never worked for a company. He was always freelance. He started working with all, first of all, he was going in his little car to, Le Brassu, La Chaux de Fond, Bienne, La Côte aux Fées, and all of that for years, and uh, designed in the hotel at night, and would leave when he sold for about a thousand Swiss francs of designs. That is why we have designs of Gerard Genta everywhere that we don't know about. I know Coram was a big client of his, Piaget was a big client of his. All these designs have been, are there, you know, or have been produced. Um, 
Then he worked more specifically for Universal, but all, never as an employee uh, for Omega, for, for Audemars Piguet. And I think it was with Audemars Piguet that he felt most part of it, because he had this very great entente between Georges Gollet and himself, and he felt very much part of it. What would you say would be his kind of first breakthrough? De Paul et Routeur, I would think, for Universal, which was, uh, uh, even today, is, is very looked at as a very ex exceptional watch. I had trouble finding one. I finally found one about two months ago. Uh, yes, the Paul et Routeur, and then came the Omega with the Constellation, and then, and then, and then, you know. Coming back to uh, AP, uh, how did that uh, relation uh, start and uh, was it before, obviously, the Royal Oak, was there already Gerard some... did a lot for AP. I found two little black books in which there are loads of AP watches designed by Gerard that I didn't know about. I'm not even sure AP knew about either. And then he would go with the people of AP to Paris because Cartier, uh, AP manufactured Cartier watches in those days. So he would go with them and propose designs to Cartier with AP. So there was a long, long story with AP. And I think he felt he, felt he would have liked to be more part of it. And he felt that he wasn't because he wasn't from La Vallée. Let's talk about the Royal Oak then. Um, how did that start? Was there a, like a brief that he received? Yes. Or, yes. He received a brief from uh, Monsieur Georges Gollet, uh, who obviously he'd been working with for a long time. And uh, the brief was the most expensive steel watch on the market, sports watch. That was it. And uh, Gérard went away and... Um, in the designs that, I sh that I'm showing, I'm showing that the very first Royal Oak, it was done in the same day, but the first Royal Oak was hexagon. People have not seen that, but it is a design that I can show you. And he looked at it and wasn't, didn't like it, and straight on the back of it designed the Royal Oak in one uh, go, because he never sketched. He would draw a circle, uh, partition the circle for the dial and would take his paintbrush and paint. There was no, you know, so many sketches there. So the Royal Oak was done in two ways. The first one was the hexagon, put aside, and that's it. But what I know is that he followed through the manufacturing process very much. He explained to me that he went to the dial people and told them at great length of how he wanted this dial. There was a lot of um, things done to this dial, engine turn and everything else. And he followed every, every step of the way the making of the Royal Oak. Coming back to the fact that he had this uh, jewelry training and used to, I, I guess, I mean, touch materials, and do you think that has had an, an impact on how he designed things because he had this relationship? I with think the... it's been instrumental because you see, designing is a, a watch, a watch is applied art, it is not a painting, you don't have that freedom. And if you do not know how the piece is to be made, you could be making a beautiful design, but which would be impossible to manufacture. And I think that was his strength. Every one of Gerard's designs that I have, and there are 3,200, can be manufactured. If the crown is designed in a certain way, the crown manufacturer only needs to look at the design, do it the same size, because he knew how you made a watch. And when it came to the Grande Sonnerie, which was, as you know, a thousand parts in it, he knew that it would require a big height of the case. And this is why he designed it as a pyramid in order to make it less thick. So he exactly knew how the watch could be made and never allowed himself to design a, an amazing design that couldn't be manufactured. But did he knew at the time or regarding this particular design or other designs, that oh, this is a winner, this is something yes, special. Yes, I think he had a very, very good instinct because even in the designs I had, some which have never been seen, he, he would tell me this could be another Royal Oak, this could be another bestseller. So he knows very well and he knew very well what 
how everything came together by magic. Yes, absolutely. He, he admired the Stern family very much, very, very much. And he was um, sitting in the dry König in Basel and they all came in and he was in his corner and he said, if they asked me for a while, what would I do for these people? And he thought they're great sailors. They sail on the lake and everything else. So he drew the porthole. And to him, I don't think there was any much pebble involved, but uh, to him, it was the idea of a porthole and a sports watch, and that, that was the Nautilus. And again, another, another clear winner there, yeah, yeah. Um, let's move on a little bit, and uh, uh, I guess until, I mean, from that point on, and being recognized and successful, uh, because, yeah, something we didn't mention, actually, is that the notion of watch designer is actually something pretty new. Uh, well, I think he invented that métier, because in the old days, watches were either round, square, or rectangular, but then people went to the bracelet factory, you so you would have the watch and would be shown hundreds of samples of bracelets and choose the bracelet. So it was much more assemblage than, than really making a watch. And I think he invented that. Now, now the world is full of designers for everything in the world. But he invented the world of designing watches. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what drove him to ultimately create his own brand? I'll tell you. Um, he had made... He, he was the one who restarted the fashion of perpetual calendars, as you know. And he, he and, and, and as you know, his perpetual calendars have got the moon in gold, the sky in lapis lazuli, because for him, uh, a moon and the sky must be in precious metal. Most of them are painted. He had that. And he was so proud of his perpetual calendars. And he was invited by the wonderful Mr. Hattori from Seiko to come and show his four or five prototypes in Waco, which is one of the shops of Seiko. And so what did Seiko do? They said, they put uh, the, the gentleman uh, who designed and put the Polyrouteur, the Universal, the IWC, the Audemars, the Patek. And one of these companies, I won't tell you which one, phoned up and said, you are not allowed to use that. This is scandalous and everything. And Mr. Hattori was so incensed that he said, Mr. Genta, you must do watches under your own name. So it was really pushed by the Japanese. We thought this was not, not fair, that he did the Gerard Genta. And, you know, Good for him, it was a fight uphill because the, La Profession was not very excited to welcome a, new, a newcomer and didn't have any money and had to build up from five watches to 10 to 20 to, to getting a factory, uh, the whole process, you know. And funnily enough, I mean, I remember in, in the late 80s, 90s, that it was really referred as being the, the most complicated watch came yeah. from this you know, more because, or less newcomer. Yes, because he was always one step ahead. When they started doing the perpetual calendars, he was re, redoing again prime uh, minute repeaters. Then when they were doing minute repeaters, he did the Grand Complication and he did the Grand Sonnerie. So he was always one step ahead, the retrograde. And today, in my designs, in the ones that I have, there are things that are 20 years ahead. Uh, I was telling some friends, I said, you know, the watches with characters have become very fashionable. I have in my safe a prototype of a Superman watch. But it's not so much the Superman on the diet, it's the case itself, it's everything. This was done years ago. So he, he was always looking forward, never backwards, you see. And then the industry followed. Yeah, and indeed, like you just mentioned, uh, I mean, talking serious watchmaking, but at the same time, there was something very joyful and playful uh, with, with these characters. I mean, it was just like kind of two different worlds, but exactly. under the same name still worked. You know? And this is what I'm trying to show in these uh, 100 designs that are being sold, the incredible uh, flexibility and inventiveness. You go from Mickey to ladies' watches, to perfume bottles, to clocks, to serious perpetual calendars, to... Uh, it, it's endless. And people have no idea, for instance, what a great 
ladies watchmaker he was. He always felt very bad that watch, ladies for watches were just small men's. He designed a lot of ladies only watches and all of this was endless so we've tried to sort of cover a bit more diversity. Why uh, did he let go his brand at one point? I tell you because uh, Gérald was getting on in years. He felt that a lot of it relied on his talent. We, it, actually everything relied on his talent. And um, the children were too young. We had that age gap. If it had been 10 years later, we probably never have sold the company and it's still a big regret. Uh, we sold to wonderful people who are the Hourglass, who are up to today very good friends and well, you know, we grew together. And, um, but it's a regret. So let's talk about what you're presenting here also in Geneva and uh, later on in other cities. We'll get to that. What is the, the idea behind that? The idea was that uh, I, I thought Gerald, Gerald loved one thing. He was an artist, so like, like all artists, he had a bit of an ego, right? So he loved recognition. And I, over the years and these years, I've thought he didn't always get the recognition he deserved. Some brands forgot who designed their, their watch. Uh, it, so I thought 10 years later when he passed away, I'd, I'd actually when I did that, I didn't know it was going to be the 50 years of the war. It so happened that, but for me it's 10 years that he passed away. And I, I, we started first this Fondation um, Jargenta Heritage, which put to tell people, look, this is what this man did. Obviously, we love the war again and not it, but that's not just what he did. He revolutionized the, the watch since industry, which was so hit by quartz in those days. This is what he did. And um, little by little, uh, the momentum started. And then I thought, for this, for this 10 years, I want to do something important. Uh, I then heard about NFTs, and it's not because it's a fashionable thing. But then I thought, as far as we're concerned, this is it. Because it's going to put in the cloud forever, in the blockchain, that this design was done by Gergenta. 200 years down the line, the story won't have changed 100 times. It will be there forever. And I thought, let's choose 100 designs of, to show his incredible talent and let's sell them as the, the, the beautiful design itself, it's a little painting really, which I hope people will have on their desk or something, but it will be in the blockchain forever. And I thought that was the right, right time. I got a great relationship for many years with Sotheby's, we started chatting about it, and one thing led to another and here we are. So you're presenting, I believe, about 30 pieces here in Geneva yes. that people can go and... Uh, yes, they are the Pont de la Machine yes. and they can be seen. And then it, you have a In further, one month, it? it will be 30 other designs in Hong Kong. And in one month, yet again, 30 other designs, 30, uh, 33 in New York. Okay. Part of it is to uh, finance the foundation. Yes, it is, because we had decided that the foundation is not just uh, about the past, it's also about... I knew he thought that there were not enough designers, real designers. He thought that uh, as far as movements are concerned, Switzerland is unbelievable. The, the movements are getting more and more sophisticated, complicated, and they are brilliant. But there's not much creation. The watches are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, or smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, white in black, in, you know, and he felt there was no creativity. So we would like to support uh, young designers, so we have a very good committee of different people of the watch industry on this committee and we will launch it, relaunch this at the um, Watches and Wonders and look at the proposals and then support a, a young designer. That's the idea. So during those big watch years, did he continue to express himself creatively on, with other type of paintings or things like that? He painted every day, so I have a lot of his painting. I think he had the need to paint every day, but also he designed every day. Gerard would get up super early, like four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock he would be designing watches. 
always, all his life. Even when he had sold his business, even when he had retired, he would design watches. He would dress up, put his tie on. The idea of designing without a tie on would be unthinkable. And, uh, and would produce one, two, three watch design, and then would allow himself a painting. Would he sometimes test his design talents on precisely other objects? Yes, very, very much. He did tables, which you'd be surprised in my house, the tables are octagonal. Surprise, surprise. surprise, surprise. Um, he, he loved doing um, forks and knives. He, had, he made some beautiful cutlery. Uh, he did for Mouton Rothschild the labels of the artists. Uh, he did them all in precious metal. And then when you serve the wine, which has been put into a decanter, you can take that label with a little gold chain and put it on the decanter. And this is at the Museum of Mouton Rothschild. Um, he did belt buckles, he did eyeglasses, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I thank you very much for Pleasure. dropping by. Thank you for seeing me. Looking forward to seeing more of this then in the coming days. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Again, uh, these drawings will be sold in four different auctions. The first one is currently ongoing. And again, uh, my sincere thanks to Madame Gentil to have dropped by uh, for this enjoyable moment. The very best to you and Viva Watchmaking!